So what I want to touch on with the next couple of problems here is uh, I want to touch on the idea of idler gears. And this is used a lot of times on exams uh, as a way to make something look nasty and, and hard to do. But uh, if you know that if you can identify that something is an idler gear, it allows you a lot of times to skip over what looks like it would be a lot of intermediate steps and go straight from the front of the problem to the end of the problem without a whole lot of those steps. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples where that occurs right here. So first of all, let's kind of identify what an idler gear is. You might notice here that this entire gear train that I have um, is basically a series of gears where each of the gears touches the next gear tangentially just at one point. Another way of saying this is that none of the gears that we're showing up here are compound gears. Remember what a compound gear is? You know, a compound gear is one where you basically have, uh, you know, two gears sort of attached to each other, right? And when you had the two gears attached to each other, what you saw is that they would have the same speed and they would transmit basically the same torque as each other. Well, you'll notice none of the ones that I've got on this gear train are compound gears. And so what happens is it says you've got a certain torque applied to gear one. Where's gear one? Okay, it says a torque of 55 foot-pounds is applied to gear one. So let's just kind of show that right here, 55 foot-pounds. All right, and it wants to know uh, what is the torque that must be applied to gear four to prevent the gear train from accelerating. And this was, uh, they were kind to us a little bit on this problem uh, because it does not ask anything about direction. Okay, so I'll tell you what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by ans answering the question that's asked, but then I'll go on and say, what if it had asked a direction and it said, you know, you put 55 foot pound of torque, the direction I'm showing on the front one, what direction would you have to turn the last one? So I'll go to that question next. Okay, so here's what I wanna show you. If you think about, you know, transmitting torque from gear one to gear five, you know, right, it, it basically, the, the path goes from gear one to gear five, from there it goes to gear two, from there it goes to gear three, from there it goes to gear six, from there it goes to gear seven, from there it goes to gear eight, and from there it goes to gear four. See how it, it would transmit torque through that gear train that way? You could do uh, a whole bunch of, uh, you know, you could do a whole bunch of uh, fractions, a whole bunch of ratios to figure out at each point how did the torque change? Like the first one would be, you take 55 foot-pounds and you could multiply it by what to get the torque at gear five? Okay, we have data over here. Gear one has 46 teeth, gear five has 52 teeth. So the torque at gear five should be what? 55 foot-pounds times, should it have more torque or less on gear five? Okay, it should have, is it bigger or smaller? Okay, it's bigger, and when you have two gears that may with each other, the smaller one has less or more torque. Okay, smaller one's less, bigger one is more. Okay, so when I'm looking at this, I should, to find the torque in gear five, I should multiply by 52 over 46. Okay, and by multiplying, by that, that would give me the torque at gear five. Well, what would the next uh, multiplication be to get the torque at gear two? Okay, gear two is smaller than gear five, so you would want to multiply by, okay, yeah, gear two has 16 teeth, so you'd multiply by 16 over 52. Then what would you multiply by? Okay, you could multiply by, to go from uh, gear two to gear three, you could multiply by 58 over 16. And how do you go from gear three to gear six? All right, gear three to gear six, you would basically multiply by 14 over 58. Okay because you're gonna reduce torque going from the larger to the smaller. 
right? And we can keep going this way. It's basically the same pattern the entire way through this train. We've got gear seven uh, next, and gear seven you'd multiply by 33 over 14. Then you'd go to gear eight, and you would multiply by what? Okay, 42 over 33. Then what? Okay, going from gear eight to gear four, you've got uh, 40, nope, uh, 71 over 42. Okay, and this would be the torque at gear four. We'll call it T4. Okay. So we did that one the hard way. We went all the way through it and did each of the ratios. But let's think about it mathematically for just a second. What can you do with a lot of these uh, multiplications? Right, 52 cancels out 52. 50, or 16 cancels out 16. 58 cancels out 58. 14 cancels out 14. 33 cancels out 33. 42 cancels out 42. And what are you left with? 71 over 46. So you basically, if you see that this is just a bunch of idler gears in between the front driven gear and the last gear, there's no reason you have to do all of that writing it out. You can see the torque ratio is literally just going to be the uh, final gear divided by the first gear, right? So this ends up just giving you, go ahead and calculate it. Uh, 55 times 71 over 46. Okay, and that ends up giving us 84.9. <clears throat> Always check the units though too, right? In this case, it's not a problem because it gives it to us in foot pounds, right? And it's asking for the answer in foot pounds, but always check that too in case that's a tricky you know, bit that is thrown into the problem, you don't want to get thrown off by that. So 84.9 uh, foot pounds. Okay, so the answer here would be B. All right, so you see there a little bit of a trick. Maybe it'll take a problem that looks more complicated and simplify it down if you notice that you've got a bunch of idler gears in the middle. Just to be totally clear, um, Essentially, gears five, two, three, six, seven, and eight, those are the idler gears. Okay? Now, I mentioned we were going to talk about the direction. So, this is also important. Uh, what direction would we have to apply a torque on gear four to prevent this, uh, you know, to prevent this thing from rotating? How would you go about thinking about that? Okay. Yeah, let's kind of chase it through, right? I think this is probably the, the nicest way to do it. Let's, let's actually assume that we're, you know, let's, let's kind of think about what if the gears were to rotate the direction we're applying the torque on this very first one, okay? Kind of think of a hypothetical movement in that direction. What direction would the next gear move? Okay, clockwise. And then what direction would the next one move? Counterclockwise, and the next one? Clockwise, and the next one? Counter, and the next one? Clockwise, next one? Counterclockwise, and this one would want to move that way. So the torque is going to be the opposite. Right, so then you say, just with just the 55 foot pound of torque, the direction that that last gear is going to want to move is clockwise, therefore to resist that, we would need to have a counterclockwise torque of 84.9 foot-pounds, okay? So again, this problem didn't ask for that, but it's possible that a problem could ask for the direction as well as the uh, actual torque value. So I think this is probably the most clear way to think about it, at least in my mind. Um, you know, you could also chase through the actual torques What's tricky about that is whenever you have just two gears mating with each other, the direction of torque is actually the same. You know, so like the direction of torque that I have here, that's the same as, as what the torque would be transmitted to the next one, right? 
but then in the process of transmitting that to the next one, the torque would reverse. Okay, so it's basically in an idler gear, the torque reverses. Okay, so then it would reverse again when it went to the next one, and it would reverse again when it went to the next one, reverse again here, reverse again there, and then reverse again here, and you would see it predicts the same thing that you got before. Yeah? If a gear is not a compound gear, is it an idler gear? Um, typically, yes. Yeah. So the way you know an idler gear is that basically it has power transmitted to it and from it off of the same teeth, right? So you think about for gear five, it's got teeth that go around, you know, this, this uh, circle. If power both goes in and comes out of that gear on the same ring of teeth, then it is an idler gear. All right, so that is that question. What I wanna do is show you one that's very similar while we're here, okay? With this one, it says you're trying to design this gear train and it meshes like is shown here. You're given a number of, uh, you know, number of teeth for each of the uh, gears that are in the train. And it says that you are going to uh, have a constant force of F1, which is given right down here, right? You have that constant force of F1 constantly applied tangentially to gear one. Uh, and you're trying to figure out the torque that would be applied to gear four uh, so that it would hold this thing at a constant speed. So what I'm gonna do with this one is I'm gonna show you the same concept but I'm gonna do it more in terms of uh, you know, the free body diagrams that would exist for each of the bodies and kind of show the reason why we came to the conclusion we did on the last problem. Okay, so what we basically see here is that for gear one, we'll start there, Okay, gear one has a force that's applied like this of 102.53 newtons. What is it that keeps that gear from accelerating? This is gear one, by the way. What is it that keeps that gear from accelerating? Okay, gear two keeps it from accelerating and it does so with a tangential force applied right there at the point of contact. Right? And what direction would it have to apply the force to keep it from accelerating? Okay. Opposite the rotational direction that F1 is trying to cause it to rotate. Right? And what would the magnitude be? Okay. Same magnitude, 102.53 newtons. Okay. Well, then we go to gear two. What happens on gear two? Okay, we know that gear one interfaces with gear two. How? Okay, we have this 102.53 newtons applied along the same line, right, but opposite direction applied to this gear. And how does gear two keep from accelerating? Okay, gear two interfaces with gear three, right? Right here. So right there at the interface between gear two and gear three, there has to be a uh, tangential force that prevents it from accelerating. And so that tangential force has to go the opposite rotational direction of the one that came, that, that was trying to drive it, right? So you go 102.53 newtons. Okay, then what? Okay, same thing between gear uh, three, excuse, we got, or on gear three, we can do a free body diagram of gear three next. Okay, and we see that we would have this 102.53 newtons applied at that interface between gear two and gear three, and what keeps that from accelerating? Okay, it keeps from accelerating because of the interface with gear four, right? So that force would have to go this way. 
But you'll notice here, every time we apply a force, it's at the same radius, right? Within a particular gear, it's the same radius where we apply the force where it comes in and where it goes out. All right, and so that means that the force value itself can't change because it needs to have the same force value to keep the, that one gear from accelerating. All right, so then we finally make it to gear four. Gear four is the only one that's a little bit different because now instead of having two interfaces with gears, with other gears, right, we just have one, and what is it that keeps gear four from accelerating? Force. Yep. The ostensibly um, gear four is going to have a torque applied and it's going to have to have a torque applied in a clockwise direction, you'll see, to, in, to uh, react against that tangential force of 102.53 newtons acting that direction. Okay, so um, this is the torque that we're trying to find. Maybe I'll call it T4 again. All right. Well, so how do I figure that out? use the pitch diameter. And you'll notice here the pitch diameter is actually given for gear four, right? So I can immediately draw that this pitch diameter right here is 17.21 centimeters, okay? So what do I need to do to find T4? Okay, I know the force is 102.53 newtons, and I need to multiply it by the perpendicular length from the line of action of that force to the point around which I would like to evaluate the moment or torque. Okay, so I think the suggestion here is divide the diameter by two but also notice that we are going for a number of Newton meters in the answer up here. So we would want to also probably do a conversion from Newton centimeters to Newton meters, which would mean we want to put uh, centimeters in the denominator, right? And there's 100 centimeters in one meter. Right? So now we're ready to punch these things in. We would have 102.53 times 17.21 uh, divided by 2 times 100. Okay, that gives me 8.82 uh, or so uh, Newton meters. All right, and that would be answer H right here. All right. Even if you mess that part up, could you still answer problem 25? Okay, we kind of already answered problem 25 because we chased through these tangential forces all the way through the gear train and, uh, and we came up with the direction of T4 based on that. So the direction I am showing T4 on the figure is the correct direction. And so we would say clockwise. Okay. Because these are all uh, idler gears, you don't necessarily have to be as painstaking as what I did on the screen. You can probably chase those things through mentally once you know this is a thing. So that's one of the reasons I show you the problem. All right, questions? <laughs>